yo, what's going on, everybody? <laughs> I'm like the first speaker ever to say, yo, in this examination hall. <laughs> And since everybody was saying, you know, their experience writing their exams, I also did my undergrad exams in this hall, and I just, I got so shell-shocked when, uh, and, and the PTSD all came back when they said, yo, we're going to be doing it here, and I'm like, oh no, uh, because I had this awful experience of missing a question on my exam, so it was just one question, but there was only four questions, um, so it wasn't good, and then like, and then so I'm like, I, I don't know, maybe it's the trauma, but I've like over-prepared for this session, so. So, um, so I have my timer here. I'm going to look down at that every once in a while. But I'm, I'm really excited to, to jump into this with you guys. Now, some years ago, I worked in Toronto, Canada. Shout out, Canada. Blue Jays, let's go. Um, and during that time in the office that we had, there was an art exhibit. And the art exhibit was called Beautiful. And it was done by a, an American artist. His name is Craig Hawkins. And Craig Hawkins uh, partnered with this Indian humanitarian organization called Agni Raksha. Now, the partnership was to create um, awareness, to raise awareness and raise funds for the horrific... Um, practice of bride burning that's going on in some places throughout the world. So in Southern Asia, um, thousands of women are severely burned every single year as a result of domestic violence or because they couldn't afford to pay the customary dowry. This company, this organization, what they tried to do was raise the funds and raise the awareness so that the women that were victims of this horrendous practice could get the cosmetic treatment that they so deserved because they were victims of horrors. And hopefully, oh yeah, now, now you can see um, what I mean by some of the victims of this tragedy. Now, the stories behind these victims, they are heart-wrenching. Many of them have had, either had acid just thrown on them and disfiguring them, and then others will have had kerosene or some other flammable liquid thrown on them and terribly and sadly and horrifically set on fire. Now, this is a sobering reality in our fallen world where suffering is so much more than some theoretical, abstract conversation or question. This is a deeply felt reality. As distinguished philosopher Eleanor Stump correctly says that the whole crust of the earth is soaked with the tears of the suffering and that has to be revered. You have to remember how truly dreadful it is. Suffering is a universal experience, and it's something that we all will encounter one way or another. There's a, uh, another set of globally respected philosophers, perhaps you've heard of them, Kendrick Lamar and The Weeknd, uh, and they once wrote in a volume of theirs, um, oops, one more back, yeah, great. Tell me who's going to save me from this hell? Who's going to pray for me, take my pain from me, save my soul from me, because I'm all alone, you see. Now, as we begin this, um, as we begin experiencing suffering or begin observing suffering in the lives of others, the questions bombard our minds. And many of the questions um, that we could meditate on, I want to drill down into one in particular, and it's this. Is there meaning in my pain? Is there meaning in my pain? And two things I just want to quickly share as I begin, um, and I do this every time that I speak on the problem of suffering or the problem of evil, which is, uh, number one, if you are somebody that is suffering here today, which is very likely, I just want to say I am so sorry for what you have are currently going through or that you've recently gone through. I'm not going to insult you by pretending that I know exactly what you're going through. I don't. Suffering's complicated and complex, and I just want to offer some thoughts. And then secondly, I want to be sensitive to the fact that many of us just, we haven't been hurt by somebody in particular, but we have been hurt by the church, by Christians. 
uh, some years ago, I was in London, and I was giving a talk on a very similar subject, and a 15-year-old boy came up to me. After my talk, he said, my mom passed away from cancer. I went to the church looking for answers. When I went to the church and asked why, why would God allow this sort of suffering in my life? And they responded to him by saying, quote, the reason your mom died of cancer was because you had more faith in your mom than in God, end quote. Let's not mince words. That is spiritual and emotional abuse, and that's wrong, full stop. That is not the Christian perspective on finding meaning in pain. There is no excuse for that toxic theology. And if you've been the recipient of such nonsense, allow me to say, I am so sorry that someone said that to you. It's not right. Now, the outline, uh, before we get into the Christian worldview's response to the question, is there meaning in my pain? We got to do some work. So, the outline is as follows. Is it impossible for God to exist when there is so much suffering? Number two, is it unlikely for God to exist when there's so much suffering? And then really what we want to focus in on is, is there meaning in my pain? Is there meaning in my pain? And uh, let's just start with number one. Is it impossible for God to exist when there is so much suffering in the world. Now, it certainly seems like it is the case that the answer to this question is yes, it is impossible for God to exist in that sort of way. I mean, just think about it. The war in Israel and uh, between Israel and Hamas, the war in Ukraine, the human trafficking that we see in our world, racial injustice, like with George Floyd, slavery, poverty, all sorts of abuses, especially towards women and girls, and all sorts of historical atrocities like the Holocaust in World War II. Now, the reason why I'm, I'm starting the lecture this way is because if God does not exist, then there are serious ramifications for the answer to this lecture's question. Suffering has this way of assaulting meaning. Death is just one example of this. I mean, think about it um, this sort of way. Suppose you have a, uh, an experience, um, and you experience this sort of meaning while uh, you're, you're having this cherished relationship. You're getting a lot of meaning from this sort of source, uh, a lot of meaning in life. But what happens when that person dies? that you're getting all of that. How does that affect your meaning exactly? Sure, in a sense, you can have some residual meaning um, as you reflect with a grateful heart on the relationship that you, and the time that you had together, for sure. But in another sense, it assaults our meaning because the source of meaning ceases to be. And if God does not exist, then that cherished relationship, that source of meaning is gone permanently. That's what naturalism would say. It would have to say. Now, further, is there meaning in pain itself in that sort of scenario? Maybe, as you reflect, again, with a grateful heart. But again, the sources of, of meaning is lost permanently, and that, that can be devastating. Um, for some people, often is the case that the loss of a cherished relationship like that, even if they reflect with a grateful heart on the time that they had together with that loved one, is just simply too overwhelming for the person to bear. Now, let's bring this back to the initial question and see if we can gain some more insights. So, if somebody argues that it is impossible for God to exist because of the evil and suffering that we say and that we see in our world, that's something called the logical problem of evil. And a really famous uh, philosopher that used to advocate for this position is J.L. Mackey. And here's the big idea. 
that it is logically impossible for God and suffering to coexist. That's the big idea. And the argument looks like this on the screen. If if God is all-powerful and all-loving, He wouldn't allow suffering, but there is suffering, therefore there must not be a God. And and here's why, is what they will say. Since God is all-loving, He should be loving enough to want to stop it. And if He's all-powerful, then He should be powerful enough to stop it. And we can really feel that when people raise that objection, perhaps in your workplace, perhaps in your school, perhaps in your university, you have come across this objection, and it is certainly in the mainstream media. Now, as formidable as this argument appears at first, it is virtually consensus that it is a defeated argument. Uh, I was once saying this to a bunch of youth. I do a lot of youth apologetics um, with Reboot, which I'm super excited to share with you guys later, I'm sure. Um, And I once said, uh, instead of um, saying that the the argument was defeated, I I tried to utilize some slang, some Gen Z slang and some Gen Alpha slang. And I don't know if you've ever seen an airplane slowly burn and crash, but that's what it was. I was like, oh, this this problem got caught lacking, is what it it was called. And, and, And they didn't laugh at all, you guys. And uh, yeah, and then I was thinking, why did God allow that suffering? Um, <laughs> but that's, that's it, it's a defeated argument. And there's all sorts of reasons. I'll give you one very, very quickly. Um, basically, uh, what philosophers have identified in this problem, as formidable as it looks, is that it comes with a lot of assumptions. It, it just assumes that an all-powerful God can, cre- can create any sort of world he wants. That's true in some senses, uh, but true, uh, not true in other senses. Um, so, you know, it, if God just wants a world where there's all sorts of um, creatures that only obey him, only do good things, then you're going to have a world that's probably not free. It's probably a world of robots. If you do want a world that's full of creatures that can love, have that sort of capacity, then you need a world with free creatures, with free will. But with free will comes uh, the possibility of suffering and evil and injustice, that sort of thing. And once you make that sort of move, then the problem doesn't seem to be as sound as people once thought it was. And you could think about this with people like Alvin Fantinga, for example, if you want to go a little bit deeper. Now, I'm not trying to say, with that sort of you know, philosophy apologetics move, uh, I'm not trying to say that that's the reason why you're going through your pain, because of free will or something like that. What I'm just trying to show is that the Bible, theologians, philosophers have come up with a number of responses to that sort of problem. Um, But next, we have to think about the next problem, and it's this. Uh, Is it unlikely for God to exist when there is so much suffering in our world? And now, this is very interesting. If you've never taken a philosophy class or theology class or anything like that, um, there's a certain type of suffering that uh, that this objection has in mind when we're trying to think about our finding meaning in pain. And the type of suffering that they have in mind is called gratuitous suffering, gratuitous suffering. And it's a suffering that is devoid, it seems, devoid of any sort of greater purpose or meaning. Uh, thinkers like William Rowe, if you want to go down that bunny trail, uh, would be a great place to start. And really what he points out is the volume of the, uh, this type of evil in our world and the nature of it. You know, it's pointless, it's meaningless, that sort of thing. And, um, and that's oftentimes what we can be seeing today. It, it, it's hard to sort of see how, um, how meaning could come out of certain instances of, of particular types of suffering. Um, I mean, think about the women that I mentioned at the beginning. It's hard to see the sort of meaning that would come out of that. You know, if you're trying to say things like, oh, well, suffering, you know, that can improve your character, well, could you map that onto them? Doesn't, that would be horrifying to try to say something like that, like that God was just trying to make them more, you know, uh, cultivate a, a more virtuous character or something like that in them, and that's why he allowed that sort of thing to happen. That, that's unlikely. So here we must be really careful. Though uh, something, though something appears, listen to me very closely here, though something appears to be devoid of meaning, it does not mean that it is devoid of meaning. 
And this is an example that I got from one of my favorite philosophers. Her name is Marilyn McCord Adams. And she has um, an insight from the following painting. Now, I'm told it's called uh, Ro, the Ro, the Rio. So it's French. I'm not French. I'm Canadian, and I should know a little French, but I don't. Uh, the Cathedral uh, by Monet. And she thinks about it like this. You know, suppose you're, you're looking at this, uh, that sort of thing. Imagine you were to just isolate the vomit green color, uh, and you were just to look at that when you were looking at this picture. Your boy is horribly colorblind, so I'm just taking it on faith that there's actually green in this picture. But suppose you were to isolate that color, you're only fixating on that color, that vomit green that's in the picture. Would it be beautiful or dreadful? And the answer is obviously dreadful. But the painting, if viewed as a whole, this, seem, uh, this seemingly dreadful color proves to be indispensable to the painting's overall beauty and meaning. Similarly, from our finite, limited human perspective, some suffering appears to be totally and completely devoid of meaning. But from God's vantage point, who can see the whole masterpiece, the color makes sense. It's an indispensable feature of the masterpiece. Concluding that some pain, X, does not have meaning because it isn't entirely obvious is just too hasty a conclusion. It would be similar to say, you know, I, uh, I love The Lord of the Rings. Raise your hand if you've watched The Lord of the Rings or read the books. Let's go, somebody. You, like, you can't be in Oxford if not read that. And, uh, and suppose you've never read it, okay? So let's all imagine we're that person. Um, and, and, and you've never read it before. You're, you're staying up late one night, and you can't really sleep. And so you go on your favorite streaming platform. Maybe it's Netflix. Maybe it's Prime, whatever. And, um, and you're going on, and, and you don't, you're, not, you're tired. It's late at night. It's 4 in the morning. That, one of those kind of evenings. You just want to throw something on to hopefully lull you to sleep. And you see Lord of the Rings. That's vaguely sort of, but I have no idea which movie cover is like the first one. So you just pick one that like kind of looks rad to you. And so you pick that one, but it's, it happens to be the second one. But you're wife was really, you know, she was up the night before, and she was watching the second one. So when you press play on your streaming thing, you, you kind of like get like in the middle of a particular scene, okay? Imagine that. And so you're, and the scene that you actually land on is um, where Frodo is, um, is saying to Samwise Ganji, his best friend, right? Uh, he's telling him to, to leave, to get lost, that sort of thing. I'm going to go with Gollum, and I'm going to do this sort of thing. And you, you stop, and you think, and you turn it off. You're like, this guy's a jerk. How could he do that to Sam? Sam's so awesome, that sort of thing. And you're really just blown away. And maybe you're so moved, you stop because you're like, I'm not going to watch Frodo. What a jerk that guy is, that sort of thing. Thank you for indulging my thought experiment with me, you guys. This is what we do in philosophy. If you were to, to turn it off too quickly like that, too hastily like that, it would simply be unfair to J.R.R. Tolkien. Because there is a meaning to that particular scene, or if it was a scene where maybe they're suffering from some battle, they're wounded, maybe they, they feel like, maybe it seems like they're giving up all hope. There is a meaning in those scenes, a significant one. Their pain contributes significantly towards that meaning. And I think something is similar is happening in our world. If we observe X pain occurring out there in our world or in someone else's life and we stop the movie and make conclusions too hastily, in our haste, we're going to miss the plot written by one who is indeed trustworthy, a skilled artist who can take a dreadful color to create a masterpiece. A skilled author who can use the pain incurred on a journey as part of a grander plot. A, an all-powerful, all-loving God who can masterfully transform even the most horrendous evil into something meaningful. That doesn't mean that, that suffering and stuff is, is good, not that at all. 
But it does mean that God is able to bring a greater good, a higher meaning out of it in ways that sometimes our finite minds simply cannot comprehend. Now, my final point is this. Is there meaning in my pain? Uh, You remember I was uh, referring to that art exhibit, Beautiful. Uh, There was one day, there was a a gentleman that came into our office that wanted to cast his gaze on all of the different paintings that we had in the office on exhibit. Here's just three of them. Absolutely stunning pieces of work. Absolutely stunning of these heroes, these survivors. And uh, the gentleman comes in. He, he, He is not a Christian. And I get to show him around. His name is Naweed. And now we and I are walking around, and after showing him a number of different pieces, we went to the corner, and it was my favorite piece. And my favorite piece wasn't actually one of these paintings. It was a photograph of all of these women together that, that posed for these portraits, and they were all together, and they're laughing. And that's my favorite piece. And now we asked me a profound question that stuck with me. And he says this, um, do these women... Do they live in community together, Alonzo? And I was really struck by this question. I didn't know the answer, so I told him, I don't know the answer, but I'm curious, why are you asking? And he says this, and I quote, because it moved me so profoundly. He said this, quote, I suspect they do because it is only those with scars that can possibly understand the scars of others. I said to him, now we we come from completely different worldviews, but the beauty and the power and the meaning of the gospel, the good news, is that at the center of it is not an unscathed God, but a scarred one. And as I walked Naweed out of the office, I said to him, man, I love your name. Uh, Where is it from? What language is it? And what does it mean? And he says, uh, oh, it's Arabic. And I was like, cool, what does it mean? And he says, good news. That's what it meant. Good news. How, How ironic. Listen, there is good news for those who are searching for meaning in their pain. Your pain means something to God, first and foremost. How do I know this? Uh, uh, One day when I was really sick at school, my dad came, uh, I called my dad, and it was one of those actual sick ones, you know, not just me trying to get out of a test, that sort of thing. I was actually sick, and and the school called my dad and said that I felt really sick, and and my dad, who was at work, he dropped what he was doing, uh, got me some soup, came, picked me up, and took me home. And the question is, is like, why? And the answer, you all know, my dad came because my suffering meant something to him. It was important to him. It meant so much to me that he dropped everything, dropped his work, and came. Because he loves me. Is there meaning in your pain? The whole, listen, the whole point of the doctrine of incarnation is to respond to that question of how incredibly valuable you are and how incredibly invaluable your, your suffering and your pain is to God. That it's important and that he came because he loves you. He values you. Your pain, therefore, is not meaningless. Your pain means so much that God came. Now, there's much more we could talk about. Again, I (laughs) overprepared. But when we think about meaning and suffering, think about the incarnation, that in the same way that my dad left his work to come for me because he loves me and values me and it means something to him, so too God has left, he left heaven, came to us, condescended, the theologian says, and laid out his life for you, paying the ultimate price.
Now you might, f with one final thought, think, you know, is there hope in my pain? It might mean something to God and therefore is valuable and, and that sort of thing, but is there any hope in it? And I think you're, you're absolutely right to, to wonder that. Does incarnation just mean that, you know, I'm drowning and then God just comes in and drowns with me sort of thing? How can that help me? That's, I, I understand that pushback, but it, I think it's misguided. If Jesus only suffered then his suffering would only be comfort to us. If he only suffered, his story would only be comfort to you and to me. The reason why Jesus is the source of hope for Christians globally, including those women who were burn victims, is because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. For the resurrection means that pain, sin, evil, injustice, and death will not have the final word over this world because Jesus is alive today and was not swallowed up by his pain. His followers can be certain that they will not be either. In the end, for those who trust in Jesus Christ and his resurrection, Jesus promises to every pain-filled heart that he will right every wrong and that our finite pain will be swamped with infinite meaning and joy. Thank you so much, everyone. Hey guys, hey, Dad, it's me, Tom Cousins. It's the Ocker Studio. I'm actually part of an organization called OCA, the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics. We make films about the big questions of life and how the Christian message has valuable, we think, answers to those questions. If you enjoyed this film, please check out the other stuff on our channel and also consider liking and subscribing. It helps us make more stuff like this. Also, we want to hear your thoughts. If you've got any ideas for future content, please drop us a message in the comments or send us a direct email. Thanks go out to all the people that made this possible, including the lovely people behind me. Here's a fun fact for you. It takes about 60 hours to make each one of these films and it's all made by our in-house Oco staff who are funded by donations. So if you do have the means and you feel like it, please do donate. On our website, we've got a helpful button labeled donate. Uh, very easy to press. All right. God bless you guys. Bye.